So my, my, my theme is going to be the fact that we really don't know uh, everything we would like to know about the human effects of low doses of radiation. So I'll, I'll try and indicate the sorts of things that we do know roughly and the thoughts, sorts of things that we really don't know. So, so what, are, what are the main effects associated with exposure to low doses of ionizing radiation? Well, I, the, they're threefold. There are others, but these are the, these are the big three. R radiation induced cancer, teratogenic effects, that's effects on the developing embryo and fetus, and hereditary effects on, on future uh, generations. As I say, they're not the only ones. We, we now know that there are certainly some cardiac uh, effects at low doses, but these, these dominate. So, um, and of these, radiation-induced cancer dominates. So that's what I'm going to talk about primarily. Um, so what do we know about the cancer risks associated with low doses of ionizing radiation? Well, most of what we know still comes from the uh, survivors at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and there are very good reasons for that. Um, first of all, sadly, it was a very large exposed population. Um, but perhaps, well, that's one aspect. The other aspect is, uh, is the large numbers of people. So the, there was a follow-up of, of more than 100,000 individuals. And the other aspect is the follow-up was for a very long time. So the follow-up was, for, well, the explosions were in 1945, and here we are uh, almost six, six decades on from that. And if you are going to understand the carcinogenic effects of low doses of radiation, you do have to follow up for many, many decades. A, a study where the follow-up is a decade, shall we say, is um, not, not that much use, because you're really not going to get the full picture at all of, of what's actually happening. So this is a little map of uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagas uh, of Hiroshima, with the epicenter, and uh, somewhere between two and three thousand, thousand yards away from the epicenter, people were exposed, but not exposed to high doses. They were exposed to low doses. So, of course, here in uh, at the ground zero, the doses were extremely high, and and, and uh, the people there perished sadly. At, in this region, not, not very many people perished, if any, um, and, but they got a, a fairly low dose. So there's a population of people exposed to low doses that we can actually study. And we can study it because we, th this is a very well characterized population. Uh, as, as you know, people in Japan are, are much less mobile than people, for example, in this country. So it is possible to follow a population for many decades. So here are some numbers, actually, from just that subpopulation of people between, uh, roughly between two and 3,000 yards who got relatively low doses in the dose range five to 100 millisieverts. And I will say this is still much higher than the doses that by and large, we're concerned about it uh, at Fukushima. Uh, but this is the dose range where we can actually draw some conclusions. So here's the population uh, who got these, this range of doses, just this range of doses now. Uh, this is data 58 to 98, so it's 40 years of follow-up. Total number of solid cancers observed, 4,400. Total number... Um, total number that you would expect from, from a control population. That's a population which didn't have the radiation exposure. Well, roughly about 4,300. So the difference here is, is 80. So there's a couple of thing, conclusions to be drawn about that, that 80 number, that, that difference. The first is it's, it's statistically significant. Because we, the, the study was of such a large number of people, you can actually see a statistically significant increase in cancer risk from which is clearly due to the radiation exposure. Uh, and, and the reason that you can see that is because the population is large and that it was followed for many decades. If the population had been smaller or the follow-up had been for a shorter period of time, you wouldn't have been able to see this. So this, this 80 number is statistically significant. On the other hand, it's, clear, it's not a huge number. I mean, it's, uh, and it, this is the total number of cancers here, and this is the radiation-induced cancer level. So what we learn from this is that 
Yes, low doses of radiation absolutely do cause cancer, but the risks are low. The individual risks are small. The individual risks are not large from radiation. Oh, right, yeah, there it is. Small but statistically significant increase in risk. So if we could do that study uh, in, that, in that, that particular dose range, so how come, well, if we really are interested in even lower doses, why can't you do the study, an epidemiological study, at even lower doses? Well, the reason is, is, is unfortunately, that 40% of any population, little more than 40% of any population, uh, will get cancer anyway, and four out of ten people in this room are going to get cancer. So as you go to lower and lower doses, what happens is that you're looking for very small increases in risk over and above that 40% uh, uh, cancer background. And to do that, you need larger and larger populations to see that tiny increase in risk over, a, over this huge background. And you, you end up not being able to do it because you simply don't have enough people in your study to be able to look at a, a uh, uh, even lower risk. And the, the result of that is that as you go down to lower and lower doses and do epidemiological studies, the results become harder and harder to interpret. So this, this is a, a low dose, or these are three low dose epidemiological studies. Um, so these are studies of, of radiologists who, not so much now, but in times past, got some radiation exposure during their professional careers. Um, so that was a good, good topic to study. So they were compared with, with physicians in, in, in other areas, not, not radiologists. So, so the relative risk means the relative risk relative to other physicians. So relative risk of one would mean that the radiologists had exactly the same risk as, as, other, uh, as other physicians. So here are the three big studies out, out in the literature. So here's the first one showing a statistically significant increase in risk in the radiologists. Here's the second one showing a statistically significant decrease in risk in the radiologists. And here's the third one showing no difference at all. So you can get really whatever result you want out of these three studies. And it is actually interesting to see which papers quote which of these three, uh, which of these three papers. But the, the point I want to make here is that uh, because you're in the noise, because you're at very low doses, it becomes increasingly hard to do epidemiological studies at lower and lower doses. And at some point, it becomes actually impossible as the dose goes down and down and down. And that absolutely isn't to say the risks are not real. It just means that using an epidemiological study to, to quantitate those risks become, becomes impossible. So let me illustrate this best I can with a little cartoon. So this, this is what we want to know. So this is a graph of radiation-induced cancer risk against radiation dose. So imagine we have a few data points, perhaps these are data points from Hiroshima and Nagasaki or, or some other population exposed. So we have some, some data points here with some uncertainties associated with them. But we really want to know what are the risks down here. We want to, so we need somehow to extrapolate the risks from up here to down here, which is really what we want to know about, because the, this is the dose range of relevance to Fukushima, for example. So what are you going to do? Well, you could put a straight line through the, through the graph. So here's zero dose, zero radiation-induced cancer risk. So this line is consistent with the data and goes through the origin here. So that's one possible thing you could do. You could do this. You could have a line which goes like this to the origin and then, and then goes along here. And that's, that would say that there is a dose below which the risk is actually zero. So there's a risk up to this dose, and then at lower doses, the risk is zero. Still consistent with the data that we have. You could even put a curve like this through the data, going actually below the line here. The implication being that at low doses, there's actually a benefit, a, a decrease in cancer risk, so-called hormesis. I don't for a moment believe this to be the case, but uh, all of these are consistent uh, with the data. Or you could put a curve like this, this orange one, which is actually higher than the, the linear 
extrapolation. So the uncertainties that we have really relate to this. The, the, how do we extrapolate risks from, from uh, doses where we can actually do epidemiological studies to, uh, to doses where we can't? So essentially, we have to use models. We have to use our best understanding of the mechanisms of how radiation-induced cancer actually works. And at least my own view um, is that the, the most plausible of these different curves is actually a straight line. Uh, there are good, plausible uh, biophysical arguments that the right way to extrapolate risks from doses where you can actually measure them to doses where you can't measure them is, is the linear extrapolation, the so-called linear no-threshold uh, hypothesis. And a hypothesis is, is all it is um, because we cannot test it down, down at these low doses. But I think it is a reasonable uh, assumption to make, and the risk estimates that I'll give will, will be based on a linear uh, extrapolation. Um, but we really don't know whether the true low-dose risks are larger than you'd get from this extrapolation or, or smaller. Or smaller. Um, but I think we do know that they can't be that much different. The, the linear extrapolation can't be that wrong because we would have seen effects in other exposed populations, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for example, at, at lower doses, if, if the risks had been, for example, a lot greater than uh, the linear extrapolation would suggest. So what's the implication of a straight right line relationship between radiation dose and risk? Well, the implication is that as you lower the dose, you proportionately lower the risk. So if you halve the dose, you halve the cancer risk. If you halve the dose again, you halve the cancer risk again. But there's no dose then where the cancer risk actually becomes zero. It's just it becomes lower, smaller and smaller and smaller as the radiation dose becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And most of the uh, agencies in different countries make this assumption, and I think it is a reasonable one. Um, but using that type of model, that linear extrapolation, does raise the issue, which I want to emphasize today, of individual risks versus population risks. And I think this is central to understanding what the significance of large, of large populations being exposed to low doses. So I'm just going to give a hypothetical example here. So suppose there is some activity, radiation exposure maybe, could be something else, where the, the, the risk of harm to an individual from that activity is, is shall we say, one, one in a million, one chance in a million. So I think we'd all agree that uh, one chance in a million is tiny. That's a very small individual risk. So if I was doing some activity where my risk of harm was one in a million, I'm not going to worry about it risk is very small. Now supposing all the people in this room are exposed to that same risk of, of one in a million. Well the chances of any harm actually coming to anyone in this uh, um, room from if, if the risk that everyone had was one in a million would, would essentially be zero. Nobody would be affected by a one in a million risk because the number of people is, is small. So the public health consequences of 100 people being exposed to a tiny, tiny risk uh, would, would be none. There would be no population risk, no, no public health consequences. But now suppose we consider the same risk, the same one in a, one in a million risk, but now, uh, shall we say, I'm making up numbers here, 100 million people are exposed to the same activity. Now we know for certain that some of those 100 million people will be harmed from that activity. Even though the risk was exactly the same as, as it was when only 100 pe people were exposed, when a huge number of people are exposed to very small risks, the overall population is, is that risk multiplied by the number of people. So it would be certain that if, if the risk was of one in a million and 100 million people were exposed to that risk, roughly 100 people would, would end up with, with, with harm. So now we have a significant population risk and a significant public health consequence from exactly that same risk. So really what I want you to think about is the difference between individual risks, which can be very small indeed, and nobody's going to worry if they are exposed to a one in a million risk, and a population risk, which may or may not be significant from a public health point of view, depending on the number of people exposed. 
And here's, here's an example of, of individual risks and, and population risks. So here's somebody buying a, a lottery ticket. Right? So, so this person's individual risk of, uh, of winning the lottery is, is extremely small, negligible, you might say. On the other hand, lots and lots of people buy lottery tickets, so somebody ends up winning the lottery. So here's, here's the winner of the lottery. But, but uh, even though the individual risk was very, very, very small and negligible, um, somebody ends up winning the lottery. So again, that's a distinction between an individual risk, very small, and a population risk, somebody actually, in this case, winning the lottery. So with that uh, preamble, let's, let's talk a little bit about the potential human health effects from the radioactive emissions um, from the nuclear reactor accidents. So bottom line, what, what are the projected health risks associated with these prolonged small radiation exposures? Well, I'm going to give you some very approximate long-term uh, radiation-related cancer risk estimates. And the numbers I'll give you, you need to think about in the, in the context of, of what I said about the uncertainties that we have about individual risks uh, at very low doses. Because these doses are, at, at, uh, are sufficiently low that we, can't, we, we don't have any direct evidence of uh, cancer risks. So we do have to extrapolate from, higher, uh, from risks estimated at higher doses. So... These numbers could be a factor of 10 smaller, a factor of 10 larger. That's the sort of uncertainty that I think we have here. So radiation risks among about a million Fukushima residents. Individual cancer mortality risk, the risk of dying of radiation-induced cancer from the, uh, from the radiation exposure. Well, roughly about 1 in 2,000. Um, which, depending on your perspective, you can say is, is a small risk or is, is a large risk. Um, we actually face risks like that um, a lot in our lives. And, uh, the, the lifetime risk of dying in Japan from a violent crime is about that. Um, just to give one, one example. So a risk of one in 2,000 is certainly not one that you would willingly accept for fun. On the other hand, it's not one generally that would dominate your life and make you very, very, very concerned. So the individual cancer risks here are, are pretty small. Now let's look at the population risks. So we talked about population risks, and that's taking the individual risks and multiplying it by the number of people exposed. So if we take this one in 2,000 and multiply it by about a million people, the people who are most exposed in Fukushima, a million times one in 2,000 is, is, is 500. So that's a reasonable estimate of how many uh, individuals will ultimately um, perish from a radiation-associated cancer. Um, so that's, that's, a really, that's a, my view, that's a very big number. I mean, five, 500 people dying is, is, is calamitous. Um, on the other hand, compare it with the number of people, the mortality from the earthquake and the tsunami, which is 18 or 19,000. In that context, it's, it's somewhat smaller. But really, the, the point I want to make here is um, there is a significant population risk, and it's something we absolutely need to be concerned about. On the other hand, the individual risk is very small indeed, and individuals probably shouldn't be so concerned about a risk of, of 1 in 2,000. And worldwide, basically doing the same sorts of calculations, well, the individual cancer mortality risk worldwide from the radiation exposure from Fukushima is, is about one in three million, so it's extremely small indeed. Again, extrapolated from risks that, that, we, that we can measure. Population of the world is seven billion. If you multiply these two together, you get 2,000. So 2,000 worldwide, 500 maybe in, in Fukushima. So we are talking about significant population consequences of uh, the Fukushima event. On the other hand, the individual risks are very small indeed. So as we think about the significance of, of uh, the Fukushima accident, uh, we need to think about it at two different levels, it seems to me. 
we need to think about it in terms of the population-wide uh, toll of, of radiation-related cancer that is going to be caused in the future, mostly, by the radiation exposure from Fukushima. And that's likely to be several thousands. So if one starts to think about the risks and benefits of nuclear power, that's the sort of number that we need to think about. So that's, that's, a, that's a risk of uh, nuclear power. That then you can start a conversation. Well, the benefits of nuclear power are less global warming, maybe, or whatever. Um, but if you think about the population risk, then you can start making some public health uh, questions and uh, policy questions about the future of nuclear power. Now let's talk about the individual radiation-related cancer risks. Well, they're really small. Um, and and there's, there's pretty well no question that they're, they're really small, and that's because the doses are really very small. And despite that, um, as, as Helen mentioned in, in her preamble, um, there's a huge amount of anxiety in Japan, as everybody knows, uh, about individual and personal radiation-related risks. So, to me, there is, there is an, uh, an imbalance between uh, the real individual risks and the level of concern that individuals in Japan uh, are having right now about, uh, about their individual risks. The concern, in my view, is about the population risks, and that doesn't relate to an individual, doesn't relate to my risk of radiation-induced cancer. So I think we've, we've, let, we've let the population of Japan down somewhat by really um, confusing these two different ways of looking at risk. The individual risk is small, and so anybody living uh, in Japan or in, in Fukushima, their individual risks are going to be small. I mean, not, not zero, but quite comparable with many other risks that, uh, that people take in their, in their everyday lives. So, to my mind, I think we have a responsibility to be a bit more careful about talking about risks and emphasize that the individual risks are small and the population risks uh, are what we should be concerned about. How can we do that? Well, education, I think, is the way. I think talking to population, to, to, to people and trying to explain what the nature of uh, radiation r risks actually are, trying to explain what we know, trying to explain the uncertainties in what we know. Um, so his, his, here is one tiny example. So this was, this was in April 2011. So the, the artists and crew of the, the Metropolitan Opera in, in New York City, and also the ABT, the American Ballet Theater, both had uh, tours of uh, Japan uh, upcoming that summer in June and July. And naturally, read what's in the papers, there was an awful lot of concern from, uh, from everybody. Is it, is it a reasonable thing to go? Uh, what, should, what should we do? So I, I in fact, went to the... Met this is actually on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera. Um, went and talked for several hours about what radiation is, what are the risks associated with... Uh, uh, low doses of radiation, um, tried to be as uh, candid as I possibly could, tried to express what uncertainties we have and what we don't have, and we had an hour of questions in both, both cases. But the bottom line is, is the Metropolitan Opera actually did go to Japan in, in June 2011. Here they are. Here's the wonderful Diana Damrau, as did the ABT. Um, in July of 2011. So my conclusion is that if you are willing to sit down and carefully talk to an audience and explain what we know, what we don't know, what, what are the issues with low doses of radiation, uh, you can get people to understand what the, the nature of the risks uh, actually are. The other Part of the story, of course, is that the, part of the reason that there is such uh, angst in, in, uh, in Japan is, is the incredible skepticism and un, not unreasonable skepticism regarding the information that people are being told. Um, I'm sure any, any of you who've been to uh, Japan 
has seen that there is such disbelief as to what the authorities are saying about what the doses really were. And we sort of do, you know, within limits, we, we actually do know what the doses uh, really are. Um, how can we reassure people that the doses are, uh, the, the doses that they got were low, which, which was the case at uh, Fukushima, by, um, except inside the plant, of course. Um, well, one, one way would be to provide rapid, individualized, measured radiation doses for every person. Um, if, if we could actually measure everybody's radiation dose uh, directly, um, well, you'd, you'd achieve a couple of things. First of all, you'd actually be able to identify anybody who really did get high radiation doses, and that, that's clearly important. They can be then monitored, treated. Um, but also to reassure the great majority of people who got very low doses or, or, or no doses. Um, and I th there are lots of studies to show that if you actually do a, a test, people are much more uh, believing of, of the, uh, the outcome than they are when some person like me comes on in a white coat and says, don't, don't worry, that doesn't work. But actually doing tests does, does work. So at Columbia, we've actually developed a, uh, a, a very high throughput biodissimetry tool, and it's based on a finger stick of blood, the same finger stick that diabetics uh, use in, in the standard, standard test, um, where we can do very large populations, 30,000 samples a day. So in principle, this is one of the methodologies that one might think of to reassure people that people are not getting very high doses, that the, there isn't some, some uh, great conspiracy going on that they really got high doses, but they were told to get low doses. One can actually measure the radiation dose directly. So let me conclude. I mean, my, my theme has been very large populations exposed to very small radiation doses. Um, it's, a, it's a situation that, that we have in uh, Fukushima, but it's not unique to, to Fukushima or Chernobyl. Um, airport backscatter scanners in airports, it's, it's very much the same story. So I'm sure you've all been through those blue things in the airports and put your hands over your head and stuff. Um, so there, the, the risks, the radiation risks are actually very low. The doses are very low. Um, but the, originally, Homeland Security wanted everybody going on, a, on an airplane to go through one of these detectors. And uh, that's sort of a billion uh, scans a year in, in this country. So there again, you have a very low radiation dose, very low radiation risk. But if you multiply it by a billion, if they, if they want to do a billion scans, which happily they're not going to do now, um, you, you would end up with a population risk. So again, individual risk, very small. Population risk, not necessarily small. So at Fukushima, the, the, there is pretty well no doubt that the individual risks are very small. And we, knew, we need to do more to inform and reassure, reassure uh, the exposed individuals in, in, uh, in, in Fukushima about that. Uh, and we need to be prepared for further future events to try and be a bit better about our communications. There's, there's also no doubt that there are going to be potentially significant population risks from the emissions at Fukushima. And we need, to do, we need to do better about quantifying these population risks because that's really the only way we can have a serious conversation about the societal risks and benefits of nuclear power is by understanding what the, what the risks actually are in a, in a quantifiable way. And I will close. Thank you for your attention.